Good evening and welcome to this special virtual event hosted by a bunch of indie bookstores. Uh, I'm, my name is Davith Wood. I am the events manager at Northshire's Manchester, Vermont location. And I'm here uh, as so often with my good friend and colleague, Rachel Person from Northshire's Saratoga reach, uh, location. Um, but Northshire is not the only one uh, here tonight hosting. Um, we've got big thanks to uh, Bookhampton. I'm gonna put the links in the chat for each of these other bookstores. Uh, Bookhampton, RJ Julia, the Wesley and RJ Julia, and G Gibson's Bookstore and Anderson's Bookstore. We've all joined to, to bring you uh, this special event tonight. Um, I'm going to hand things over to Rachel in just a second uh, to introduce our authors tonight. Um, but just a few things really quick. We've got a Q&A box in the, uh, at the bottom of the screen. So at any point that you have a question, please enter it in there. And then at, at the end of this evening, uh, Rachel and I will, will um, um, pose those questions for you during the Q&A. And finally, before I hand things over, just a note of thanks. It has been a, uh, during the normal years, it's a hard time for independent bookstores. And the last two years have, have not been that. Um, so we all owe our continued existence to your, your support and we are enormously grateful for it. Um, so thank you very much. Rachel, please take things away. I am so happy to get to welcome these authors to our screens tonight. Maggie Shipstead is with us tonight to celebrate the paperback release of her novel, Great Circle, which was an Indie Next selection, a New York Times bestseller, a Today Show Read with Jenna book club pick, a Women's Prize for Fiction nominee, and is on the Booker Prize shortlist. I was fortunate to host her at Northshire's Saratoga store a few years ago for her remarkable novel, Seating Arrangements. And it is a real thrill to welcome her back to talk about her newest novel, one that swept me away with the beauty of its prose, the courage of its characters, and the in intricacy of its plot. She will be interviewed tonight by fellow author Kim Van Alkamata, whose novels Orphan Number no. 8 and Bachelor Girl are both Northshire staff favorites. She's a regular and wonderfully insightful interviewer for Northshire's event program, and it is a thrill to have her back with us again. Please join me in welcoming them both this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel and Daphid. Um, and thanks, Maggie, for talking with me today. It's, it's really my pleasure to get to meet you. Um, I'm just going to try to change something about my screen. So <laughs> I'm not like staring. I'm sorry about that. There we go. <laughs> no, well, thank you. Thank you for doing this and for being here as well. I really appreciate it. That's great. So um, congratulations about all the success with Great Circle. It's really wonderful. I mean, I really loved it, so I'm not surprised. Um, but I wondered, like the the Jenna Bush, the read with Jenna pick, was that was that kind of a surprise for you, the Booker Prize? I mean, when you're at home writing, you really don't know what kind of life a novel is going to have once it leaves your desk. What's the experience been like for you? Yeah, it's been really um, wonderful and rewarding. I mean, I worked on this book. I started writing it in the fall of 2014. Mm -hmm. Um, and I spent over three years writing the first draft, uh, another nine months revising after my agent read it. It was two, two and a half years almost between selling it and publishing it. So, so much time went into it, but just having people read it and respond to it um, has been, uh, you know, like it's just a weird imaginary world for so long. And so then to be able to be like here this is the thing that I was thinking about and working on it is really wonderful but yeah all that stuff um you know it is a surprise and you can't I knew about read with Jenna pretty far in advance like maybe mm -hmm. five months before it came out I think so but you can't tell anyone so um that was really exciting it was really reassuring in a way um and then the booker is like a, more like a bolt of lightning and I didn't mm -hmm. even think I was eligible for this year I thought when I sort of half thought about it, I've been like, oh, it's not a thing, you know? Um, and again, you find out sort of before it's announced. So yeah, all of that was, um, it was really thrilling. And I try to, you know, remember always that all these things, prizes and whatnot are so human, you know, so it can, your luck can really go either way, just depending on who is picking the books that year and, and what their tastes are and what their, sort of um, rubrics are. So yeah, I, I felt incredibly fortunate. Well, I'm so glad that Great Circle is getting that kind of attention because um, I don't know, it's a hard book to sum up, right? In that little elevator pitch. And uh, I wonder if you wouldn't mind giving it a try for, for the people at the webinar tonight. 
tell us what is Great Circle about? Yeah, it is hard to sum up. I have sort of a two sentence one <laughs> and then I can sort of, you know, expand infinitely. <laughs> um, but the two sentence summary is that Great Circle is about a fictional female pilot named Marion Graves who disappears while trying to fly around the world north south over the poles in 1950. Um, and it's also about a contemporary, contemporary being 2014 uh, movie star who's playing Marion in a biopic about her life and gets sort of drawn into this question of, of who Marion was and what happened to her. That's a good summary. I love, you know, in reading it, um, the, one of the things that really kind of captivated me is it, we weren't just back and forth, back and forth. I mean, we were. But then we also took these excursions and sometimes we would follow Marion's brother and sometimes we would, um, you know, Hadley was talking to all kinds of different people in Los Angeles. And um, sometimes we'd like go back in time in the history of Montana. And um, it was, every excursion was this sort of delightful, um, I don't know, I just felt like you were, taking me places as I was reading it. And um, it always felt like I was being taken care of as a reader, but it also felt so, I don't know, it was so interesting. And I was kind of wondering the whole time, like how do all these things tie together? And then towards the end of the novel, there are these moments where I'm like, no way that's being tied in. It was really gratifying. So I, I just very much enjoyed reading it. Thank you. Yeah, it, I, a lot of that is the product of the fact that I can't plan my books before I start writing. So all I knew when I started was this pilot would disappear flying around the world north south. And I knew that I wanted her to transport warplanes during World War II, which would have historically been possible either in the US or the UK, but I hadn't quite decided which one. So that's all I had. Um, and so I sort of sat down and then, you know, a couple of days in decided, well, I'm just going to start this with a ship launch in 1909 in Glasgow, you know, and, and so all those little um, detours and add ons, I was really hoping I'd be able to pull them all together. I had a really hard moment about two years into writing the first draft. So my, my first draft was 980 manuscript pages. And did like- that, Did that scare you? Or did okay, that scare your agent? <laughs> yes, everyone was reasonably very terrified. And I mean, this would still be 750 manuscript pages, but it was like another quarter. Mm -hmm. um, and so two years in, I'd written more than 400 pages and I could just sense I wasn't even halfway through. And I had no, I, I didn't really know where it was going. Um, and so it was, it was always, it's too much to hold in your head. You know, I say it was like building a house with no blueprints. So you end up with like turrets and stairways to nowhere. And so a lot of the uh, process, even as I was drafting was about wrangling these, these pieces in, but then I, I also had to sort of defend, um, it's shagginess a bit when we went into the editorial process, cause it was too long. And so the obvious solution is, well, let's cut, you know, there are these sections you were alluding to some of them called the incomplete history so it'd be like back to the prehistory of montana and sort of zooms through history or the history of aviation um it'd be like well let's just get rid of those and we'll save 40 pages or whatever and so i really had to be like no you know this is a book about scale it's about two bigness and so i want that sense of of everything being in there but um yeah and because i had no plan like i didn't anticipate that some of the more minor characters would become as prominent as they did like Marion's brother I you know got to this section where he's a teenager and is sort of running away for the summer and I was like I'll just write a few pages sort of alluding to what he's doing and turns into this 30 page chapter that then changes the whole course of the book so you know it was both there's a lot of freedom to it but it was alarming mm -hmm. also well, and then first a novel that ended up having such scale and such sweep and such scope. Um, it all started with a statue in an airport in Auckland. Like, how did that set this whole process in motion and kind of what sustained you during those years that you were drafting? 
Oh man. Yeah. I, um, I had planned to write a, I had this idea that I was going to rewrite or do a sort of take on Mary McCarthy's The Group as my second novel. Mm -hmm. um, I had started working on it. I got distracted. I wrote Astonish Me, my actual second novel instead. And then when that was done, I thought I'd go back and like reconnect with this idea. Um, and I was traveling in New Zealand and I, I'd often done a lot of my writing away from home. And so I was like, I'm going to work on this, but it just died on me. I could tell it wasn't getting any momentum. It felt like paper dolls. And um, so I was at the airport in Auckland. This was like fall 2012. And uh, after seating arrangements had come out, but before astonished me. And I, I went, you know, I was feeling sort of sorry for myself. I didn't know what I was going to write next. And, and at the airport, I saw this statue of this pilot, Jean Batten, who was from New Zealand. And she was the first person to fly from England to New Zealand um, in 1936. And it's, it's really appealing statue, but there was just something about it. I thought, oh, I should write about a female aviator. Mm -hmm. um, great, that's settled, you know? And so that sort of went into the back of my mind for another two years while I was sort of dealing with Astonish Me, which came out in 2014. Um, and then I finally sort of started working on it. But yeah, during that, those, all the years I was then working on it, you know, when I finally got started, if I don't know what sustained me. I mean, sheer determination and a sense that the only way out was through is like, well, I've invested, you know, three years into this thing that I don't even, I'm not on contract for. I just have to hope, you know, it turns out okay. So. I had, I mentioned earlier, I had kind of this dark day two years in. And, and after that, I had to really refocus on just doing what I could do in a day and not thinking about the big picture, but just sort of proceeding forward little bit by little bit. It was almost sort of a geological process in itself. It's, I, I like how you talk about, you know, it, you're not in contract with it. You're just, it's sort of the further you get into it, the more it's like you owe it to the to the work to finish it because you know there it is that story won't be told it's like the story is like come on tell me is yeah that although that? there's always the danger of like sunk costs too mm -hmm. just like what if i'm still just laboring at this out of stubbornness but i don't really know so there's always this sort of voice that's like is this the right project have you just wasted all these years yeah well i know i have what i thought was my second novel is like in a drawer and will never come out mm -hmm. and um yeah, sometimes you get to a certain point and you're like, it's not really going to happen. And, yeah. yeah. Um, while you were writing, though, you were traveling. You were traveling all over the world, not just researching uh, places that you wanted your characters to go, places that you wanted to understand better. Was there a particular kind of moment that was really unexpected, a place that you went where the influence on the book was surprising to you? Hmm. I mean, yeah, so I, uh, like I said, I started really writing in fall of 2014 and kind of late 2014, early 2015, I sort of fell into writing for travel magazines. Um, and so I, I sometimes got assigned to random places, but I could also pitch places. So I was pitching places I wanted to go sort of mm -hmm. for the sake of the book. And I really wanted to get to the Arctic and to the Antarctic, um, which I did. Um, yeah, there are definitely places in the book that wouldn't have featured if not, um, if I hadn't happened to go there. Like the Cook Islands are Marion Marion's first stop on her round the world flight. And I had happened to go there because it was a free layover going from New Zealand to LA. Um, you know, it's like, okay, sure. I'll take a look, you know, and, <laughs> and then uh, kind of turned, turned out to be on my route. Um, the first time I went to the Arctic was to Svalbard in the Norwegian high Arctic. So it's above Scandinavia. Um, I went on a artist trip where it was 27 artists in a three masted tall ship just sailing around for two weeks like what could go wrong yeah. um and so that was my first sort of exposure to that true um wildness and I, I think both in the high arctic and antarctica that you have this feeling like this landscape doesn't care whether i live or die in fact it's actively trying to kill me um and so that feeling i think really came into the book and and also people I met on my travels who are who work in that kind of wilderness and have a, a deep confidence there um you know I think in, in some ways informed Marion's character as well it's yeah I I 
very much enjoyed when all the places that we went in the in the novel and um yeah i like doing that too i um have a book i still haven't written but in it my character has to go somewhere and so i thought well i've always really wanted to go to suriname in south america i speak a tiny bit of dutch and um so i'm like okay i'll go yeah. there and um, yeah, so I have all my notes and all, my, you know, and one of these days I'll find the project where that journey fits. It didn't end uh -huh. up where I thought it was, but I, I love also that interconnection between travel and writing and where do the characters go? Where does the novel take you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have read a book set in Suriname. There aren't, there aren't a lot of those. <laughs> it's yeah. I thought it was going to be my next, I have my third book, which is just kind of sitting printed out with little crystals on top of it, mm. waiting for my editor to get back to me. Mm -hmm. And then um, I thought I was going to write like a sequel to that, but it was very heavy um, mm -hmm. World War II stuff. And um, instead, I just, I don't know, I've now I'm writing something else. I don't even know if anybody will want it. So we'll see, <laughs> but we'll get, we'll get back to Suriname eventually. Good. Um, one of the reviews that I read, um, Lynn Steger Strong's review in the New York Times, she was really focused on the sentences as the foundation of the novel and especially a novel like of this scale. I think what she said was, um, it's at the level of the sentence and the scene, the small but unforgettable salient detail that books finally succeed or fail. In that great circle is consistently and often breathtakingly sound. And I so resonated with that because uh, like I mentioned to you earlier, I can be an impatient reader and um, it's you know pretty common for me to skip a little bit. And I didn't wanna miss a single sentence in this whole book. And I especially, there was a, on page 264, there was this little, like I think you called this trippy little description of Los Angeles, but it kind of stopped me in my tracks. It was like this prose poem that just lifted off the page for me and I wondered if you would read that and share it so people get a sense of just the writing itself and how beautiful it is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, this is from um, one of Hadley's sections, the mm -hmm. modern movie star. And uh, these are in first person, whereas the historic mm -hmm. stuff um, is in third person. I will say to those who haven't read the book, this isn't really representative of the style. <laughs> this is more of a little flourish. Um, it was a flourish, but it was, um, I just, it's like greedy of me to ask, but I just really wanted to hear it in your voice. Sure, absolutely. Um, so Hadley is sitting uh, by a pool in the Hollywood Hills with um, a man who's producing her movie. Oh, and they've eaten mushrooms. <laughs> oh, yeah. He forgot to answer, or maybe I'd only asked inside my head. And for some unmeasurable period of time, we sat there looking at the view thinking about whatever. And then he was like, what is this place? It's the angels, I told him. I know, he said, but what is it? I could hear wind chimes coming from a neighbor's house. So I was like, it's wind chimes. What else? A helicopter went blinking by. It's helicopters. What else? It's wind chimes and helicopters, I said, and it's muscle cars and leaf blowers and trash trucks picking up everyone's bins and tossing them back like tequila shots. It's coyotes yipping like delinquents who've just left lit firecrackers in a mailbox, and it's morning doves sitting on power lines practicing the same sad four note riff. It's the thrum of hummingbird wings and the silent gliding gyres of vultures and the long-legged stepping of white egrets through shallow green water in the concrete channel that's the river. It's dance music pounding in a dark room full of people pedaling bicycles going nowhere. It's gongs and ohms and whale songs soothing in the dim inner sancta of spas. It's a Norteño song bouncing out of a passing El Camino and school kids singing, oh beautiful for spacious skies in a classroom with the windows open and the rasp of a beat from somebody's earbuds you pass on the sidewalk. It's pit bulls barking through chain link and chihuahuas yapping behind screen doors and poodles snoozing on terracotta tiles. It's blenders and grinders and juicers and hissing steel espresso machines the size of submarines and waiters who talk too much. Any special plans for the weekend? Do anything special over the weekend? 
and water so precious, splashing into fountains and pools and hot tubs and tall glasses on shaded patios, burbling from hoses and geysering from broken pipes. And underneath, there's the hum of traffic, always there, like the ocean that lives in seashells, like the cosmic whoosh of the expanding universe. At least that's what I tried to tell him. I don't know what I actually said. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that. But I don't know, you said it wasn't necessarily representative, but you know, I hear it and I hear again that sense of scale at the mm -hmm. end, but also those those details that just help me see a place that I thought I kind of knew, but really through um, like fresh eyes, just those details. And that's what, then when you take me places I've never been, that's why I felt like I was in mm -hmm. such hands. And, and I was like, take me to Antarctica, you know, <laughs> take me to the Cook Islands, take me to, you know, England during World War II, take me back in time. Um, so no, I, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. That, um, that piece, I, I remember when I had the idea to write that section and I was leaving, I moved to LA and right when I started writing the book in fall, um, 2014 and I was leaving the gym in my neighborhood and I, it was like this sort of green post sunset sky of these silhouettes of palm trees, which is an image a little later in that section. And so I kind of went home and wrote that. And then it was something that I didn't know where it would fit into the book. Mm -hmm. And I was sort of picking at it for years. You know, I'd sort of come back to it and add a little bit or take something away. And so it was, it was that section was sort of a touchstone, I think, in some ways for, for the sort of larger sense of the book. So I think you're right about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad, it, I, I'm glad it made it into the book and I'm glad <laughs> it stayed in the book. Um, Earlier, you said you start the project and you don't really have a plan and you don't really know where it's going to go. Um, I usually, I like a plan. <laughs> Otherwise, I, I just feel like I'm not really sure where I am with things. So I spend, and I think I spend too much time sometimes on structure and architecture because drafting is, is hard for me. It just always makes me anxious. Revising, I love because it's mm -hmm. like I've got something to work with. So mm -hmm. when you have this 900 page manuscript and you're like, okay, now we have to revise it. What was that process like for you? Um, I mean, yeah, I, I would love to be able to plan. I've mm -hmm. tried it. I think like when projects have died on me, it's partly mm -hmm. been because I tried to, I tried to figure it out in advance. Um, I seem to need that sort of uh, sense of discovery, but I don't think it's ideal. There, there's certainly some major cons with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, when I, the Marian sections more or less stuck um, from pretty much the first draft throughout. Hadley is, you know, uh, much less than half the book, um, and her sections I had to take a couple runs at. Like I wasn't totally sure how to make the modern sections and the historic ones resonate, but in a way I didn't think was too cute or too pat, um, but felt connected enough. Um, and so I was always kind of moving those around and even changing what happened. Like there once was a version of it where Hadley and Redwood, that producer were like in the archives of the New York Public Library, like, you know, sifting through boxes. And because um, <laughs> I love to read books like that, but I couldn't make it work. And I also like earlier in a draft, I had Marion's Round the World Flight, which is now consolidated at the end of the book where it falls chronologically. It was broken up and was throughout the book, but it was just kind of too much for a reader to kind of hang on to. And it also sapped, as my editor pointed out, sapped a lot of the um, suspense. So when we started, when I started working with my editor, um, yeah, I mostly, I shortened it mostly through small pervasive cuts, um, which I think helped it on a sentence level. I was always, every time I read it, I was just cut, 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 um, just sentences and words and paragraphs, which if you have 980 pages to work with, like really adds up. Um, the one big cut I made, I had a plot line where Jamie, Marion's twin brother, joins this sort of communal uh, um, community, communal community uh, uh, in Canada, called the Dukabors, and they're sort of Russian Quakers who emigrated to Canada at the beginning of the uh, 19th century, maybe later. And um, they're pacifists, they sort of 
all their um, worship services were sung. Uh, they're vegetarians. They would stage these nude protest marches through the Canadian countryside when they, you Sounds know, didn't want to. Super interesting. And 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 Jamie, yeah, it mm -hmm. seemed like something he'd be drawn to. But my editor was like, you know, this is sort of one weird thing too many. Like, can we just? <laughs> so I had to. That was the one time I cut a big sort of fifty-page chunk. But then I had to fill it in with something else for Jamie, which became when he goes to Vancouver and, and sort of becomes an artist. And so, you know, I ended up net losing 20 pages or something like that, really underwhelming. So it's this really long, just sort of chipping away process, um, making everything sort of like redistributing where Hadley fell in the book, trying to pull things together. And it was, it was really cumbersome. Like part of the, there are many problems with writing a book this long, but like you make one change and it just ripples out through the whole thing. And so you have to go through 700 pages, you know, like looking for, for the after effects of this change you've made. And it was, it was, you know, even in the page proof stage of things, I was, they were still finding like these sort of errors that came from edits and yeah, it was, I don't recommend the experience. Did it, was there any point where it ended up like a wall full of post-it notes or was it all like notes within the pages? No, I mean, uh, I use Scrivener. Do you mm -hmm. use Scrivener? Um, I, I keep meaning to, but I'm very resistant to it. So I'm just like, I've got my word, Microsoft Word, but yeah. I'm, I hear about it a lot and it's very intriguing. Yeah, I could, I don't think I could have done this without Scrivener, just from an organizational perspective, because I, you know, then it's, I would either have a thousand page Word document or 80 different Word documents, and you can kind of keep things in, in one place. So um, that was sort of my primary organizational system. And then my research, I just did as I went, part, because I couldn't plan, I didn't know what I needed to know. So I'd say, you know, I have a great idea. Let's start this with the launch of an ocean liner. And then I'd be like, well, how do you launch an ocean liner? You know, and, and I'd buy a bunch of used books and they'd show up and I'd sort of learn what I needed to learn to write the next 10 pages. And then I'd sort of forget all that and move forward. But um, yeah, I wouldn't describe that as ideal either. Although my, my research did always kind of spawn new ideas and directions because I'd come across something and be like, oh, I'll throw that in. And then it would sort of, you know, change the course of the, of the plot. Well, I, I love that too. And I, I very much relate to like getting a whole bunch of used books arrive at the house because one day I'm like, oh, I need to know about this thing and um and yeah there's a point the the book i just finished is about um it's about early computer technology which mm, the, oh my gosh to organize the concentration camp system during the holocaust mm -hmm. and it's also about a computer programmer in the 1960s who's trying to help a survivor find out what happened mm. to his mother who was lost during the war and so it's all this stuff about early computer technology and punch cards and I have no, I don't know anything mm -hmm. in this. I'm an English major, you know, I don't, mm -hmm. when I took geometry in ninth grade. I was like, thank goodness I'm done with that. And yeah, there's a point at which I'm like really working so hard to learn everything. And then there's the moment where I'm like, you know, I don't need to prove to the one computer programmer who might actually read my historical fiction novel. Um, it just needs to kind of make sense you know mm -hmm. um but i guess as a writer it sounds like you also you, you need to feel like you know enough to forget what you don't need to know yeah you know and it's always that balance of sort of you know not putting things in just because you went to the trouble of finding it mm -hmm. out which um you know that enabled some cuts along the way but um i also can be like a pretty pedantic reader like when i find something that i know is a mistake i'm like oh, but I'm sure I make them. So I'm pretty, I, I try to be pretty careful about it. But I don't know if you find this, but sometimes the hardest things to find out are the simplest, you know, just these questions like, when would this particular kind of house in Missoula, Montana have had electricity or indoor plumbing? You know, when would that be feasible? And it's, that's not always easy just to get the sort of everyday details. So I end up, you know, reading memoirs or novels sort of from the time and trying to trying to puzzle it out. But yeah, I mean, and it's your brain can only hold so much. So I also connect to what you're saying about you try to like pack it full, and then you just try to go while it's still there. And then especially the, with a book that then changes subject all the time, I just have to sort of flush it out and, and it would be gone. Well, and the things that are 
important and the things that are like really like uniquely interesting to you, they'll sort of stick and almost seem like something you kind of remember. And what I mm -hmm. find is then, then it's like, okay, I know where I can double check that this was real and I didn't just dream it, but it's, it's kind of, um, I think Janet Burway, I taught from her book, um, Imaginative Writing for many years. And uh, she says the, the best kind of research is um, like, don't take too many notes, uh, let yourself forget a lot. And then the thing that's really sticking is, is the thing that'll be really generative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's only, I, I take bad notes anyway. So I kind of <laughs> get excuse for it. Yeah, I, don't, I could just get so tied into knots. Like um, my one sort of real research trip that I took was to Stanford. Um, it was when I was writing the wartime section where Marion flies in the UK and she flies for, for those who haven't read this organization called the Air Transport Auxiliary, which was civilians, both men and women, and they would fly warplanes from factories to airfields or repair depots to airfields. Um, super dangerous. They didn't, they weren't allowed to use radios or instruments. And so they're like, fly below the weather, which in the UK is like impossible, especially with all this war smog. Um, so I went to, and 27, I believe, American women went over and flew. And so I went to Stanford where they have the papers of some of these American mm -hmm. women. And so it was like, I was like, I'll just need two days. And then, they, you know, this usual thing happens where boxes and boxes arrive and each box is full of like a million like onion skinned, single spaced, eight font, just letters home from these women. So I ended up just frantically taking pictures on my phone and looking at them later. But I so often would just be like, wait, you know, then then what would they do in their training and I'd have to dig through and dig through and dig through. And so sometimes that felt so frustrating where I was like, I just want to write. And so the Hadley sections could be a real relief from that because it was modern day and in the city where I live and something I was much more familiar with. And so just being able to like sort of zoom through or, or just draft with a little bit more freedom was really um, a relief. Yeah, I... I relate to that, you know, getting like really caught up in the research and especially like archival research. And um, although when you were talking about that, it reminded me one of my teachers in high school, Virginia, uh, she flew for that. Mm. I think I wrote a paper about it when I was in like eighth grade. I, she flew for the ATA? I think she flew oh, amazing. Planes during World War II because I went yeah. to a very long time ago. Um, <laughs> Yeah, now it, now it makes me want to go to Stanford and see if I can find out for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, women also flew in the U.S. too. There are more, so, but if she went over there, there may be, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember now the paper I wrote. I remember sitting down with her and interviewing her and writing mm. a history paper, but I don't remember the details. <laughs> Let me just check in with uh, Rachel and Dafid and see if we have questions that we want to make sure we leave some time for. Oh, thanks, Kim. Uh, and, and thank you, Maggie, too. Uh, this has been wonderful. We do have one question already, and you kind of addressed it already. It's from Stephen Piper, and it's about the Scrivener app. Mm. Uh, he says, in your acknowledgments, you thank the Scrivener app. That caused <laughs> me to wonder whether you wrote the book in order, in order or mixed and matched the various detours and add-ons uh, as I looked at Scrivener, and they tout that as an advantage of the app. Yeah, I did mostly write it in order. Um, although, like I was saying, the Hadley pieces got sort of reshuffled. Um, but yeah, it it's really hard to explain. Like some people will use it to organize their research as well. It's, it's just, you can sort of attach your research to the documents as you're writing and your word processing within it. And you can reorganize all your sentences or your, um, sorry, your sections and chapters. Um, but uh, yeah, that and and so at the beginning, I had even more ambition for how I would use it. But what ended up being the really important part for me was just being able to sort of, in some ways, see the layout of the book, even though I would still have to sort of scroll through um, and then be able to move things around. And I could set documents side by side, even like if I was sort of moving part of one chapter to another, I could, I could sort of get a sense of it, which was really uh important just because it was so overwhelming to begin with <laughs> that if I were just sort of at sea in a word document I 
I wouldn't be talking to you right now. I'd still be working. <laughs> well, it's all very inspiring because it's it's the kind of thing that just keeps coming up when I talk to other writers who are like Scrivener and I'm like, oh, I hate change. It's like not easy yeah. for me, but I, it's, I yeah. have to look into that. It's also um, not entirely intuitive right at the beginning, but you have to do the sort of old school like tutorial that mm -hmm. comes with it. But yeah, I do recommend it. Well, thanks. Um, and one question, oops, sorry, go ahead, go ahead Rachel. Um, one question that's come in anonymously is uh, from an audience member is whether you have had any particular female pilots that you fell in love with as you were researching. Yeah, you know, they're also interesting. Um, I'm looking over at my books. Uh, you know, I thought about Amelia Earhart when um, I was conceiving of the book. It was important to me that it not be about her, but mm -hmm. I was interested in this difference between the way we process disappearance and death, which are often the same thing. And I very strongly believe in Amelia Earhart's case was the same thing. Um, but I think it was so hard for us kind of as a culture to absorb the fact that this like beautiful, vibrant sort of woman who was sort of this hero figure vanished um, and drowned in the, alone in the ocean. It's awful. Um, and so there's sort of this cottage industry of like, well, maybe she did this or maybe she did that. Um, and so I was interested in that dynamic as well as her as a person. But, you know, there's so many female pilots who were genuinely famous in that era. Um, people really paid attention to aviation and were, you know, you would be front page of the newspaper for breaking a speed record or an endurance record or something like that. Um, so I was, I mean, I read Beryl Markham's book, West with a Night, um, fascinating, beautiful book. I really like this book called Spreading My Wings by an English pilot named Diana Bernardo, Bernardo Walker, who flew in the ATA. She was sort of an aristocrat, kind of this fast, fast sort of flapper girl, um, and also a very good pilot. Uh, she was later the first British woman to break the sound barrier. And she wrote this really sort of chatty wartime memoir called Spreading My Wings. Um, Eleanor Smith was sort of this teenage phenomenon. And um, in the U.S., she's the only person still, I think, to fly under all the bridges on the East River, um, which she did, I think, in the 20s. Um, Jackie Cochran, who... Uh, um, was sort of spearheaded bringing American women into the ATA and then also the, the programs for female pilots in the U.S. Um, she's a really fascinating person. She just came from literally nothing uh, in sort of um, the Florida panhandle um, and became also a really uh, uh, notable pilot and um, uh, was the first woman anywhere to break the sound barrier. So yeah, I really um, was caught up in a lot of their lives and just the era was so interesting. I thought um, part, another thing that was interesting about it was just how I think people at the time were really sort of titillated and excited by and inspired by these women doing something that was so dangerous um, and was such a sort of outward manifestation of independence. Um, but at the same time, female pilots were sort of expected to maintain this veneer of femininity for some, and, and for some of whom it was natural. Um, but others, you know, there's this expectation that you're photographed like powder in your nose after you land, after setting your altitude record. Um, and I, I think people found that sort of reassuring um, and that whole dynamic, especially going into the war of sort of social norms being exploded and then contracting back again in the 50s was um, played out a lot in the experiences of these these pilots. I think there was another question in the Q&A. Did you see that one, Rachel? Yes, there sure I did. was. I, just, I didn't from... wanted to let Carol. you finish your thought since we talked over you last time. <laughs> oh, that's it. It's um, but... Okay, um, so Carol wanted to know, Maggie, if you could elaborate on some of your travels that you experienced while writing this novel. Sure, absolutely. Um, most of the places on Marion's route I've been. Um, I've been to Antarctica twice. Um, the first uh, magazine story that I pitched that went through was to the New Zealand sub-Antarctic, which also figures into the book a bit, um, these islands between New Zealand and Antarctica. Um, and so I, I went on this two week voyage on, on a ship to these islands and um, it was a really life changing trip for a lot of reasons. It was sort of the first time I've been somewhere really wild. Um, but I also I've written a modern love about this. So if anyone would like the more detailed story, you can Google my name and modern love and it'll come up. But um, I sort of 
had a connection with the expedition leader on that trip. And then we decided we wanted to see each other again. And so he was like, well, if you can get back to New Zealand, you can come to Antarctica. So I essentially went on a five week first date to Antarctica to the Ross Sea, which is really, really, really far south. Like most people go from South America, which is how I went the second time. And you usually don't cross the Antarctic Circle. It's like which is 66 degrees south. We went to 78 degrees south to the Ross Ice Shelf, which is where Marion takes off from when she disappears. And it's a floating piece of ice the size of France um, attached to the, the continent. So that was um, a game changer as well. Uh, during these the years I was writing the book and traveling, it, it sort of my travel writing kind of accelerated. So by 2019, I think I spent more than 100 days out of the country and um, so it really changed my life. Like as I was as I was writing, I'm trying to think of some other good notable ones. I tracked snow leopards in the Himalaya. I saw snow leopards. Um, I went spearfishing with Jose Andres, the chef and humanitarian who's in um, Ukraine right now. Um, uh, I took a train from Istanbul to Budapest. Um, I swam with humpback whales in Tonga. So all these things, they're really good gigs. Um, and, uh, yeah, and the Arctic I've now been to maybe five or six times. So that all really informed the, the book. And, and whenever I could, I would sort of seek out interesting flying experiences because I never took, um, pilot lessons. And so, uh, I had to sort of absorb what I could, particularly from pilots who landed in these sort of extreme environments, like on one trip, uh, for a magazine in the Canadian high Arctic, we, uh, took an excursion in a, a twin engine, um, turbo otter. And as we were on this island, the sort of weather kept getting worse and worse. And so we flew back at 140 feet um, above the Northwest Passage and then took three tries to land in this crosswind. So things like that um, ended up being helpful, uh, if also alarming at times. When I love the Alaska section too, when Marion is, she spent some years in Alaska, um, kind of incognito in hiding, but also kind of finding a sense of herself. It seemed like an interesting interlude in her journey, you know, a kind of moment for Marion to collect herself again and almost reconstitute herself after this terrible relationship and all the adventures and misadventures of her unsupervised youth. Um, and then she kind of comes out of Alaska, you know, into the war. And I sense that the time that she spent there as a character is really important for her development. But I think you also mentioned that you might not have even written her going there if you hadn't gone to Alaska yourself. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it was a logical place for her to go. And I, I think that's the part of the book. I think what you're saying is exactly right about it. It's also the part of the book that probably has the least momentum, which some mm. people don't respond to, but I like a little lull. Mm. Um, yeah, she, uh, you know, it's still true that Alaskans are called the flyingest people, and it's because it's such a huge area. It's so rugged. There's so few roads, um, many of which aren't really easy to travel for a lot of the year. And, and so even in the very early days of flight, Alaskans were really quick to identify the potential uses of airplanes. You know, something would take a week by dog sled and two hours in a biplane. And so, you know, mail routes quickly mm -hmm. started to, um, to go by air, but of course it's also very dangerous. Um, but just the vastness of it, um, I thought would be something that would attract her. And it's in a moment in her life when she kind of needs to disappear. And a lot of people, my brother's done some work in Alaska as well. And he said, uh, if, if you live in Alaska, you're probably the skeleton in somebody else's closet and you weren't mm -hmm. born there. <laughs> um, I went a couple times for travel stories. And um, the last time I went was this past summer for Outside Magazine and did a all women's backcountry, just backpacking trip. And it was July and it was like 35 degrees and raining the whole time. <laughs> it's just a really harsh place. But of course, um, beautiful and and. Um, varied too I think you know it goes so far north and then uh the Aleutian Islands play into the wartime part of the book as well so yeah no at the, I read that article and at the beginning of the article I was saying to my partner I'm like we should go on an all women's backpacking, backpacking trip to Alaska and by the time yeah. I got to the end of the article I was like it was cold and raining the entire time <laughs> maybe not <laughs> yeah 
it was it was way harder than I expected because I'd done other backpacking where I covered a lot more miles and I was like this is no problem and then oh my gosh I've never been so tired but so, I mean that's that's like the lesson you take from that place I think always no matter what and you said you kind of fell into the travel writing sort of as part of your research for this book is that something you're looking forward to continuing yeah I mean I've come I've gotten back into it I just spent all of February in French Polynesia um, on an assignment which was not the plan I was supposed to be a two-week trip but I had a negative PCR test 24 hours before my flight left and then when I landed in uh, in Papeete I had COVID so I had to quarantine for a week and I missed the sailing of the ship I was supposed to go on and they were like well if you stick around you can go on the next one so anyway I mean it was it was great to get back into it but that was also a reminder that COVID's still very real and, and can be you know best case scenario a, a big inconvenience um, I'm going to Fiji in a couple of weeks on another assignment so it's kind of starting to come back and I definitely do want to keep doing it um, it's incredible um, but I think I was a little bit burned out by the time COVID started just because it it had been so much and I was so rarely home um and yeah but um I know I never have great advice for people who want to get into travel writing because I I did sort of fall into it and, and I've been so sort of charmed with it but um I do have appreciation too it's very difficult every time I write a piece it's, I'm struck by how hard it is there's so much to sort of consolidate into a small mm -hmm. space and and um just over time sort of learning more about how the travel sausage gets made has been really interesting so was the the sort of worldwide COVID shutdown, did that happen at a time that was good for your book? I can't remember exactly where I was in it. I mean, I we were deep in edits. Um, so I think I maybe had one more draft to do and then copy edits and, and page proof. So it was sort of fine. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I don't know if you had this experience, but early on in the lockdown, I sort of thought, oh, you know, this will be useful, horrible, but useful time for starting something new just with the, I always need quiet time. But I actually found it really stifling. It was too quiet. Like I, I need to go out and be able to work in a coffee shop with my computer and just have people around or have sort of the stimulation of relationships. And um, so it took me a really, really long time during COVID to kind of get on track with something. And I think I was also just depleted by this book. This was a big effort. It's a big effort. And yeah, I, I also, I was kind of in the middle of drafting and I just found it so, even though I didn't go anywhere, very upsetting and distracting. And during that time I was writing about like concentration camps and it was just, it was just so much. It was just really mm -hmm. heavy and I, yeah. And then I'd think, well, I should just be cranking words out every day because yeah. here I am stuck at home. But I was like, also, I'm kind of worried the world is falling apart. Right. So yeah, not the most yeah. creative. And, and there's other authors who they were like, all right, we're going to, we're going to make this time work for us, you know? And yeah. Good, good for them. Yeah. More power to them. But I was like, you yeah. <laughs> Well, before I ask you kind of what is this next thing that you're sort of working on, let me check in with Rachel and Dafid and see if there's any other questions that we want to get to before. There is another question uh, from Carol. Uh, she says, Maggie, the high energy you put into the novel, did you have a voice about the book jacket cover? Mm. Oh, um, yeah, I mean, you always sort of do, but it comes down to sort of how much capital you want to expend fighting about a book cover. But this is the only one where it was the first design I saw and everyone loved it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, this one was very easy. My other books were both sort of struggles. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I thought this this really captured the spirit of it. And I was happy too that the paperback is, um, not identical, but still recognizably the same book and kind of a, a riff. But yeah, I um, I really love this designer. I think she's amazing. Um, I have a short story collection coming out next month, which she also designed the cover for, which I will hold up so you can kind of see it. It's like a take on, um, you know, in-flight safety instructions, but clearly something's gone amiss. <laughs> um, so yeah, I uh, I was really happy with this cover. Okay. 
And so then, yeah, the question, what, what are you working on? Yeah, so I went through a few kind of iterations and it was both the question of having too many and too few ideas. Like I, I really like to read mysteries. And so I sort of thought, I don't know, Kate Atkinson goes back and forth, like, so can I. And uh, I had an idea to write a trilogy of mysteries with sort of one overarching mystery through all three, but each one would sort of have its own thing. Um, but then kind of during the George Floyd protests, I was like, you know, I just, it's fine to write about cops. I personally don't really want to right now. And to me, I couldn't really figure out how to uh, write a mystery without that element. And so I was like, okay, you know. And so then I, I sort of thought about mystery in different senses, but what I've eventually settled on is um, actually using one of the characters from that mystery idea, but it's it's not a mystery. It's just going to be, I think, a domestic family um, kind of drama set in LA um, now. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm trying I'm trying to rein in the scope, but now I'm so sort of programmed to the granularity that Great Circle had, which is both big and small. And so I, it's been sort of an adjustment. And I, I also realized I hadn't really faced a blank page for seven years. Like I was always working with something. Um, so it's been a challenge to get started, but now I feel um, connected to it and, and like this is gonna stick and just it's sort of lack of mental and, or I just need more, a little more time now um, to get in on it. But it's also this question of like, how do you set things chronologically? like? To, to, with the pandemic like anything you set now within the past couple of years you're going to bump up against that and so it's like it's I think that's going to be a challenge for a lot of writers because not everyone wants a book about the pandemic but you can probably have a book that goes into that time period without being about it but I don't know we'll see I don't know this is why I stick with historical fiction I think the um maybe 1971 might be the most recent moment I, I'm working with. Um, and, and I think, yeah, I think I, I'm not sure how to deal with contemporary issues and moments and things seem to be shifting. Whereas when I look into the past, I'm always looking for, I don't know, strange things that people don't know that much about. And mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not, wouldn't claim to have discovered anything, but there are a lot of things that, there are just so many things and yeah. that people don't know, like people generally are like, I never knew Hitler had a computer, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, you know, it just sounds so odd. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I like that sort of stuff. Um, my first book was about kids in a Jewish orphanage in like the 1920s in New York. Um, and yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't envy you. What I do like is being able to pick things out of the past that I know have a, a kind of resonance in the present, um, but that feels safer. So, well, good luck. That's, that's an amazing <laughs> challenge. Yeah, <laughs> well, I also think you're wise to mind. avoid uh, cell phones. Back in the days when people couldn't get in touch with each other, it really like facilitated a lot of drama. <laughs> like so much drama. Yeah. I, what is it? Um, Oh, I don't, is it Tessa the Durbervilles where there's somebody, she slips a letter under a door, but it goes under the rug and like the whole plot like spirals from there. And now it yeah. just texts. It'd be and, like, did you get my text? Yeah. Like I can see you read it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this has been amazing. Let me just check back in with uh, Tafid and Rachel for any last minute wrap ups. Maggie, thank you so much for talking with me. Oh, of well, thank we, you. We, yeah, thank you so much, both of you. Um, well, we do have time for just one more question, and, and uh, Donna uh, DM'd me, and she asked us for both of you: is what's the most interesting bit of of research that has uh, ended up on the cutting room floor that you've done that didn't make it into the book? Um, I had a couple in this book. I had, you know, these sections that are called the incomplete histories. And one of my bigger cuts when we were trimming it down was an entire one of those about Antarctica. And so it started and like, you know, my editor was like, people have just read 600 pages. They don't really want to be like 20 million years ago when the continents. Um, and uh, so that was, that was one thing. But I had this other little riff that I was sort of enamored of, which was, the um you know this fish the 
coelacanth, coelacanth, um, that people thought were, was extinct and had been extinct for millions of years. And it got sort of hauled up in a fisherman's net in South Africa in the 30s. Um, and someone, there was a scientist who would sort of take his bycatch and study it. And she made the connection to these fossils she'd seen. And kind of concurrently with this, almost at the same historical moment, and a scientist, uh, a Jewish scientist who'd fled to Sweden was sort of discovering nuclear fission. And the fact that these two things were happening at the same time, I had I had it in the book and, and was rightfully pointed out to me. It had nothing to do with anything, but that was my favorite little tidbit. <laughs> Well, the book I'm just finishing now, it's, um, I think it'll be out in summer 2023. It's called Stars Fall Into Place, and it's the 1960s and 1940s. It's in the Netherlands during World War II. It's in New York City now. And um, the first draft I sent to my agent was, I think, about 500 pages. And, and um, he said, I didn't know you were writing an epic. And I was like, I didn't mean to write an epic. So in kind of reeling it back closer to 400 pages, there were just lots of weird, weird things. I have a character who is a shoe salesman. So I learned all about like shoes and um, learned much more about the computers than I needed to, um, just to feel confident in the things that I, I did keep. And um, also learned there was a, I don't know, a customer of a business where my character works has a metal factory. And then I like learned all about like metal factory history. So, you know, just lots of little things. It's not so much one, one big thing, but I like learning stuff. And sometimes it's, um, yeah, sometimes it's like, okay, stop learning and go back to the writing. But I, I, I never feel like it's time wasted. You know, it always, mm -hmm. somehow it feeds into the process and it gets you where you need to go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's the fun. <laughs> you kind of have to take your fun where you can get it as a novelist. Mm -hmm. I think the fun is being able to sort of turn your attention to different things and go down these rabbit holes and, and learn about different things with each book. It's really mm -hmm. um, rewarding, I think. Mm -hmm. Those rabbit holes are unfortunately going to be have to where we leave it. It is, um, we are out of time, um, but Maggie and Kim, thank you both so much for your lovely conversation this evening. It's been a real pleasure listening to you, audience. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, thank you to our great friends at Anderson's Bookshops, Bookhampton, Gibson's Bookstore, and RJ Julia. Um, and everyone have a lovely evening. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye.